uh, today, they're going to kind of do a little bit of a tag team on their presentation. So, Ananga Nason and Nehru Amaru are both in the uh, Department of Dermatology. So, Anand is a professor of dermatology and, uh, and biological chemistry. He's also an, he's an active clin a clinician scientist. So, he sees patients here, and I assume he sees patients over there. Got that uh, no, Ben Herbert. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> um, so, and uh, Ahila is, uh, she came here as a postdoc. She got trained in Creole at University of Central Florida. Then she came here as a postdoc, which was trauma and multi-photo microscopy. And she's just done some just beautiful work with us. I, I know you all have seen um, the, the, the system in action. And so, um, so she, uh, and she and Anand have created and they form this really nice um, kind of clinician scientists and, and scientist pairing for a uh, for few different um, app applications of skin. And so they have a way of trying to do the same that I'll, I'll see how I'll see I'll see how we go. And so let's welcome our speakers. <laughs> so um I think, uh, so we're going to talk about a couple of things today. I think um, what, we're, what I'm hoping to get across, um, and hopefully going back and forth, you'll kind of see this, is how, you know, you can work together in terms of thinking about technology development and application, and about how, you know, when you start thinking about the problems you want to address, that you have to actually think about, um, you know, how your technology fits an application and where its niche would be. So the ideal project, whenever we think about a project going together, would have like, you know, three components. One would be, you know, you have something that you can demonstrate that um, addresses a problem which no other technology can address, right? So um, the first challenge is really finding out what that problem is. And to do that, you kind of need to understand your technology, you need to understand its strength and its limitations. And you need to understand how you can use the technology to push the bio biological understanding or health understanding, plus also, you know, push the technology so that it goes back. So hopefully we're going to go back and forth to give you an example of how that might work. Okay, so one of the key things to think about when you think about project design or you think about developing a technology is, is what is the overall impact? So you know, maybe not all of you guys are going to go into get NIH funding, but probably you're all going to try to get money from somebody sometime. Unfortunately, that's our, our job nowadays is to do that. So what, it all focuses on impact. So NIH's definition of impact is the likelihood your project will exert a powerful influence on its field. And really, um, nobody gives you a great example of what exactly that is. But it's really composed of uh, a gestalt of the project's significance, innovation, and approach. And grant funding decisions are really driven by impact. Um, and, I, and the industry has its own definition of impact. It's does your technology address a specific problem in an area where there isn't much com competition? Is a problem um, broad or relevant to a large population of patients or industries? And is your solution unique as compared to existing ones? So, I think to start a good project, you want to think about what would be the broad impact of your technology. And sometimes we, we don't always think about that. We think about, you know, I have this imaging method and now I've advanced it to go from this scale to this scale. But really the, the level you want to think about is, well, if it goes from this scale to this scale, what problems can it address that a wider field technology could not have, right? So, um, you know, we work on skin, and skin is a great um, area to work on imaging, mainly because it's accessible and you can see it. Um, skin therapy, disease therapy is a big business. I don't know if you guys watch TV or you have time to do that, but if you watch, there are so many ads about skin therapies. There's like these psoriasis medications where people are jumping in a pool. I don't know why they all jump in a pool. <laughs> There's the eczema market that you hear about. There's vitiligo where you see um, ads for new vitiligo. And the, th the ads on the TV are never ending. It's because skin therapy is, um, skin disease is very prevalent. It bothers people a lot. Everybody wants to do something about it. 
but uh, from an imaging perspective, it's easily accessible. It's not so non-invasive imaging can be used. Ideally, it regenerates itself, so you can take off a piece of skin and it'll regenerate itself. Um, patients don't necessarily like that as much as you think they would, but that's that's another advantage. Um, but the issue is, each of these therapies are increasing in um, cost. So, for example. You know, a psoriasis therapy now, um, the cheapest one is about $12,000 a year. Um, some of them range to be about forty dollars or $50,000 a year. If we think about skin cancer therapy and immunotherapy, we're looking at an annual cost of over $200,000 a year. And the big problem is, is that, um, you know, we can try patients on all of these therapies, um, and, but we don't know when they're working or when they're not. Um, and that's a real problem. Uh, one thing is, you, you know, the drug companies love it because they're like, well, you know, $40,000 here, then you switch to another medicine that's another $40,000 and everybody's great. But patients hate it because, you know, the, these medicines are not trivial. And in the case of cancer, it's even worse because, um, you know, this is life-threatening. And then you have patients that are on medications, you don't know if they're working, and they're just sitting there waiting to find out six months, eight months down the line. So the real question is, can we use imaging to understand disease development and therapy response? Um, because all of these companies... Uh, um, have to develop um, ways to do this. And how do we currently do this? Well, um, there's a couple of ways. So we do, uh, you know, blood immunophenotyping. That's like you give a drug, you think it hits this cell type, and then you basically take somebody's blood and see if you have lower or higher levels of that cell type in the blood. But blood is not skin. So everything you see in blood is not what you see in skin. So you might be able to say the drug does what it's supposed to do in the blood, but you can't say that it's doing what it's supposed to do in the skin. There's skin biopsies where you take a piece of, of skin and then you look at um, the histology to see what's happening. Uh, and the problem with this is, is that they're very spatial. And we'll show in a minute, you know, that skin disease is very spatial and spatially organized. organized. And you can't appreciate that spatial organization just by looking in biopsies. So you might biopsy the wrong area. You don't know that you're missing or seeing what you're supposed to. And how we do it is typically measures, we just look at people and we say, oh, you have this much disease today and you have that much disease yesterday, looking at your, your, your body and then calculating by number of hand units how, many, how much body surface area you have. But none of this is very um, precise. And if you can imagine, you know, if you have a very, everything is more and more targeted, if you have a targeted therapy that targets one specific thing and you're measuring something very general, um, you only really get to see that at the very end of your trial. So that, um, you know, there's three phases of trials, right? So there's phase one, there's phase two, and phase three. So phase one is, is when you have a therapy and you're trying to see if it's safe. So you try that on patients to see if it's safe, um, and you're not necessarily measuring a disease response. What people do is they try to throw in things like measuring their blood immunophenotyping and things like that, but they're not even really sure that... Um, you know, that's correlating with a skin response. So, you know, and a lot of these companies got excited by this idea, but can we actually look at what's going on at the skin at a cytologic level and say, you're responding or not? What will that do? That'll basically shorten, we'll get, get rid of the drugs that are not working very early, right? Because you'll know what's going on. And um, it'll allow you to, drugs, to develop drugs faster. Okay, so... Um, What's the right technology for this application? And so Mihaela is going to go over this a lot more. But, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, in skin disease, we think about things like immune cells, inflammatory cells. We think about things like um, skin thickness and epidermal thickness. We think about things like root pigmentation, which we'll talk about in a minute. And what's the right technology to look at that? You know, so... Um, OCT has made a lot of advances, particularly looking in vascular structure. So I think for looking at vascularization and things like that, there's a lot more advances where you can get to a near cellular resolution, but it may not necessarily get you a cellular level resolution in the epidermis. Reflectance confocal microscopy, I sort of like to think about it like you're shining a light on something and seeing a shadow of what comes back or what doesn't. So you see shadows of these cells and you look at their pattern of refractive indexes and you might be able to discern about what a um, uh, what what cell types they might be and what's going on. Um, NPM is um, what Michaela is going to talk about. It has subcellular resolution. You use molecular contrast 
to identify distinct cells and layers. So what we came up with is, is that, you know, really to effectively deal with these skin disease problems, you need a technology that can measure a cytologic response to get an imaging biomarker that correlates with a molecular one. So then you could say to somebody, oh, we're developing this new therapy, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, for vitiligo, and, um, you know, with vitiligo therapies, for example, it takes six months to see a response by eye, but if we can see it in six weeks, then um, your drug development timeline is short. So the idea was to figure out something that could image in a molecular and cellular resolution. So we talked about the, um, the looking at molecular and cellular endpoints and correlating them to imaging ones. Well, you know, when you start out something like this, you want to start out with something that's easy. You don't want to start out with something that's impossible, right? So um, we wanted to identify changes in disease activity that you could easily measure by looking at molecular contrast. We know that we can't image with these um, cellular resolution technologies on your whole body, right? You can only image a small area. So we want to be able to have a disease that's um, spatially limited that we can look at in an area that's manageable. Um, we wanted a disease where we could look at things that we had enough patients to monitor and measure. Um, we wanted to try to think about, can we learn something new about the disease from our imaging studies that's not known? Um, and we, we focused on vitiligo, one, because, you know, I, I, I'm like one of the international experts in it, but also because, um, you know, the best um, uh, molecular contrast agent in the skin is melanin. And so um, we could look at uh, repigmentation response and look at cells coming back, and that could be more easily potentially measured um, by imaging than with other things. And the other thing we know is, is that spatial patterns of how the skin repigments has not really been studied because it's not something that you can easily measure. Melanocytes are actually practically invisible on histology, um, but you know we can see them with imaging. So what is vitiligo? It's an autoimmune skin condition that affects about 0.5 to 2% of the population. It's at these CD8 positive T cells, destroy the melanocytes. Um, most people get it before 30 years of age, but can be at any age. Um, and then conventionally, we treat them by like stimulating melanocyte stem cells to repopulate with UV therapy or um, by implanting them. That's shown in the, um, in the lower figure over here, where we put these little graphs in and then they start to repigment. Or we think about, um, you know, shining UV light and getting them to migrate out of the hair follicle into the skin to repick. We know that um, this, Sorry. this, yeah. Um, I didn't know there was like a therapy for that. Do you do that on every body part then? Or yeah, so so there's, that? yeah, so there's a good, that's a good question. So um, I didn't kind of go through this, but the, um, there is a couple of different therapies which we'll get to. So there are some therapies that specifically attack the immune cells, the CD8 positive uh, T cells, so that they they don't um, they're not recruited to the skin quite as much. So there are some JAK inhibitor therapies that do that. Um, the the repigmentation induced of the melanocyte stem cell activation is a therapy that's given with the whole body UVB. Um, the grafting therapy is pretty much used in conditions where um, the uh, where you have, you know, limited areas. So you can put it in small pieces of skin. Usually you're limited to probably about maybe two hands worth or something like that. Um, um, please go, like if you're doing steroid therapy or something, how long is the... How long is the duration? Yeah, yeah so um, a typical, good question. So a patient, 90% of patients get about like 75% improvement with light therapy over the course of nine months. Okay. Yeah, but it's, they have to come in three times a week. So it's okay. not an easy thing. Um, the topical agents uh, vary in terms of the, the JAK inhibitors are the ones that work the best. And that has about like a 60% improvement rate on the face over the period of about six months. Okay. Um, but the problem you can get at, get at, which I'm getting at, is, is that nine months is not a great time to have a trial because that's very expensive. Six months is not so great either, specifically if you have a new therapy. And you also have to think about so now think, just think about this. So each therapy you're thinking of costs like maybe what? You're charging patients $10,000 or something like that. So you're going to go through all of this development phase, right? Where you're trying to develop a therapy. And at some point, you're going to be on the point where um, this therapy is going to be $10,000. 
how do I know it's better than the existing therapy that's also $10,000, right? Yeah. And do you want to spend all that money investing if you really don't necessarily? And so that's why these early endpoints are so important because we want to know earlier the better, like if something is working or it's not, so that those drugs that are not going to be better, the, the company can cut bait, right? So they're not like developing all these things, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, this is kind of what I was talking about. So, so the um, the, uh, the the skin um, recruits these active T cells, and that's through these um, cytokines CXCL9 and CXCL10, and they're activated in the cell by these pathways involving JAP kinases. So you have these inhibitors and inhibitor production of these molecules, and the T cells no longer come. Interesting, the T cells are activated. Um, largely, the largest source of this, these, they can be produced by immune cells, but the largest source of them in the skin is the keratinocytes, which are the cells in the skin. So, um, so that's why, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to understand the dynamics of what, when these cells are coming in and when, what they are and when, um, and how they're recruited. Um, so um, keratinocytes make the CXCL9 and CXCL10, and this is kind of, there are some mouse models, but how they work is that um, you take in these T cells and you activate them to such a point that they already attack the skin, and then you say, oh, they attack the skin and the pigment's gone. But actually, if you look at, um, I'm not sure if I, I, I'll show a little bit of that here, but if you look at uh, vitiligo skin, the number of T cells you see is very, very little. Um, they're hard to detect on biopsy, so it's not clear that this is a great model of what's happening with people. So can we see that? Can we see the T cells in the skin? So that was a measure for me. Um, so we know that uh, one of the things that's important in vitiligo is these interactions between these keratinocytes that make these cytokines and the um, immune cells that they recruit. So there's this back and forth, the keratinocytes make these factors that don't let the melanocytes come in, um, and then the, the T cells come in um, as well. But what's interesting about the disease, I think I have here, is that it has these spatial patterns. So you, um, and that's shown over here on the, on the right, which is that, so for example, in inherent disease, you'll see areas where, you know, you have areas where there's a white patch, but there are areas of melanocyte nests that are still there. The pigmentation is still there. So there's spatial microdomains within each lesion. As they improve, sometimes they don't completely improve, and those spatial microdomains persist. So why are these areas that are white and that aren't improving, why are they staying there and why aren't they going away? So this is kind of a really ideal question for us to study in many ways because, you know, seeing melanocytes is not an issue with imaging. Um, and so we can kind of understand, you know, are they coming back here? When are they coming back? When can we see them? And how can we measure them? And so that's been one of the focuses. And like I mentioned, um, the, these JAK inhibitors have shown a lot of responses, but they also have the same problem of um, spatial domains where you get partial responses and not complete responses, even though the T cells are gone. You don't understand why that's the case. Um, grafting and oral therapies are under development, but again, you know, how well do they work? Why do they work when? And in what patients do they work at? So, um, with that, I will hand it off to Hela, and she's going to talk about imaging, and then we'll go back and talk about how you correlate that with clinical disease and where we're going next. Okay. Take a few minutes. I know um, Anand wanted me to focus on uh, multiphoton microscopy, but I couldn't resist the temptation to sort of put it into context in comparison with the other imaging technologies you guys have heard about or you'll be here about uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. So uh, just a quick question before, is there anyone here who didn't see the, uh, the NPM, NPM clinical device in clinic yesterday or all of you came for the demo? Wonderful. Okay. okay. So um, clinical skin imaging with label film multiphoton microscopy, but let's um, 
Let's see where where BC is in uh, comparison with uh, with other technologies used for uh, for clinical uh, skin imaging. And um, I really uh, wanted to to sort of uh, go through them in the context of, of these um, uh, different uh, features uh, specifics that each of these technologies uh, have. And um, what's really important in, uh, when, when you uh, translate them to, to clinic, it's these particular features related to the, the spatial scale, the, the spatial resolution, molecular and functional uh, information, uh, the ability of the, of the imaging tool to, to longi longitudinal imaging, and then the uh, speed. Um, so uh, we, we the, the main idea being to understand the unique advantages of each of these technologies and uh, know uh, how to select them uh, based on different uh, uh, applications. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, uh, to start briefly with uh, uh, you know, the, the standard of, of care, what's in the clinic right now, like the, the 3D uh, body photography, the, uh, the, the Moscow E. Um, they, uh, they are like the, the first uh, line of um, uh, assessment uh, of, the, of the lesion at the dermoscope. Every uh, dermatologist uh, uh, has it. It's, it's the first thing you, you use to, to look at a, uh, a lesion. Um, however, so the spatial resolution is, is limited. And another limitation with these technologies is that uh, you, uh, you don't might see beneath the, the skin surface, right? You need some sort of advanced imaging technologies to, to go uh, beneath the, 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 the skin surface. And um, um, an example of these uh, technologies are the uh, spatial frequency domain imaging, uh, diffuse optics, uh, laser speckle uh, imaging, which I think you've, you've learned about um, uh, today. You would use these technologies if you are interested in a particular functional uh, information. If you want to um, uh, look at the uh, concentration of oxy, deoxy, uh, hemoglobin, tissue oxygenation, uh, changes in, uh, in uh, water uh, content. Uh, if you want to, um, if you want to get more uh, uh, resolution, if you want to see the delineation. Uh, between uh, epidermis and, uh, and uh, the dermis, look at hair follicles, some uh, of the uh, monitoring of, of uh, different treatments, you use uh, uh, OCT, optical coherence tomography, but you don't get much uh, molecular uh, or functional information from that unless you combine it with, uh, with photoacoustic uh, imaging or, or Doppler uh, that, that would uh, provide some of that uh, uh, information. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the main limitation with that is still the, the spatial resolution. You, you don't see cellular uh, structures with, uh, with these approaches. Um, Anand uh, mentioned it. Uh, this is a um, relatively well, popular uh, imaging approach in, uh, in uh, a clinic, diffractance from focal uh, microscopy. Uh, so you would use that if you are interested in the uh, morphological structure with cellular resolution. You don't get any molecular or functional uh, information from, um, uh, from it. Uh, Multiphoton microscopy uh, gets you that uh, molecular contrast and some functional imaging related to, uh, to uh, uh, metabolic uh, information. Uh, however, the, the standard uh, multiphoton uh, microscopy has this um, limitation related to the, the spatial scale. It's usually a very small um, uh, field of view. Uh, that, that also limits the ability to do uh, longitudinal uh, uh, imaging, and it's also uh, slow. So uh, people are working on each of these technologies to sort of push the, the boundaries and improve these uh, specifics mm -hmm. to make them uh, more effective for certain applications. So this is what we've tried to, uh, this is what we've been spending time in the past few years uh, to do with the uh, multi-photon microscopy. This is what we did with this um, device, which we call Flame, and I'm, I'm going to talk about 
So we, uh, we push the spatial scale from uh, sub-millimeter to or a few hundred uh, microns to, to centimeter scale. Uh, that gives us the, the ability to, to do this uh, longitudinal imaging, and I'll show you how we do that. We also address the, the, the speed we, we can do that really in, um, uh, in a, a few minutes. Uh, so let's uh, let's see our um, our flame. Feel feel free to interrupt me if you if you have questions. So. Uh, FLAME stands for Fast Algeria Multiphoton Exoscope, and it's really a portable bedside imaging device which we highly optimize for effective uh, uh, clinical use. And, um, uh, Sasha and Amanda in, uh, in uh, our team uh, really work on this particular device you guys uh, see in clinic, mostly the engineering part of it. So um, the, the main uh, specifics of this uh, device, it can uh, provide this uh, large uh, area when we image in vivo. The, the single field of view uh, has almost um, uh, one millimeter square with maximum scanning area, uh, a centimeter square. Uh, it can uh, capture images uh, quite rapidly, uh, multi-photon uh, microscopy approach, and that's thanks to a uh, deep learning uh, 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 image denoising uh, algorithm we use to reconstruct the signal-to-noise um, uh, ratio for the images we acquire uh, rapidly. Uh, we have uh, submicron resolution and enhanced molecular contrast uh, based on second harmonic generation uh, from uh, collagen and time resolving mm -hmm. what are cited for essence from uh, keratin, NADPH, FAD, uh, lastin, and uh, melanin. So we acquire uh, both density and, uh, and lifetime uh, images. Um, <clears throat> just uh, just uh, briefly, uh, if we uh, open up the, the imaging head, uh, what, do you, uh, what do we have uh, uh, underneath? I won't spend much time on it. It's, it's really a bit of engineering, but I, I wanted uh, you guys to, uh, to see it. So how do we go from micrometer scale to millimeter? centimeter. Uh, first of all, like the heart of a microscope is the uh, objective, and for obvious reason, we uh, uh, selected to, we, we chose to, to work with uh, one that has low magnification and uh, high NA. This one in particular is developed by, um, by Olympus. Once you, you pick the, the objective, you have the, uh, the focal length of the, of the lens, the, the field of view is determined by the, the scanning angle at the back aperture of the objective. Then the scanning angle at the, the mirror, it's really, uh, it, it depends on the magnification of the, of the system. We chose to work with a, a, a low of magnification to minimize the, uh, the optical aberrations like a spherical uh, um, astigmatism. And um, that, that really, um, uh, meant that we needed to, to work with large beams which were limited by the, uh, the uh, entrance beam uh, diameter and the size of the, uh, of the mirrors. Uh, so these are the, the design uh, considerations. And then another um, uh, important part of the optical design, we, we separated the, the two mirrors. We have a relay lens system in between the two mirrors and the beam expander after the second one to um, uh, be able to minimize the motion of the beam at the back aperture of the objective. And we optimize these lens systems to, to minimize the, the optical uh, aberration, uh, the optical aberrations. The, the, the only one we still have in the, in the system, uh, and we allowed it to be there during the, the design, it was our only way to own. Uh, to optimize it was the, uh, the defocus. So since we image in, in uh, thick tissue, uh, we, we are okay with, uh, with having a, a bit of uh, uh, field uh, curvature. So that's, uh, these were the, the design considerations for maximizing the, the field of view from a single uh, scan. To further uh, expand the, the field of view to, to millimeter and centimeter scale, we use, uh, I explained it um, 
during the demo uh, yesterday, we used this uh, tiling uh, mosaic for the for millimeter scale. For centimeter, this is too slow. Uh, we use uh, the strip mosaic where we park one of the mirror and we, um, we scan the, the other mirror on the stage that's connected to the, to the skin. So we move the skin uh, under the, uh, the objective. Uh, I make it sound uh, uh, that it's easy. It's not. It was very challenging to implement that uh, uh, in Google. Um, it's, uh, and that's related to both engineering and also data uh, acquisition. Um, but uh, it works. And uh, I'll show you how that helps us uh, with uh, this longitudinal imaging and uh, uh, really enable enables us to, to be to, to go back to the same uh, to the same location. Before I show you those images, I just wanted to uh, go uh, sort of um, describe uh, exactly what the, the, the features that we see and the, the sources of of um, uh, contrast. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a common image with a uh, standard image with usually get at the dermal and dermal mm -hmm. junction in, uh, in normal skin. Uh, this is a 10 megapixel image acquired in about 30 seconds. And uh, what we are looking at, so it's about 2.5 by 3 millimeter uh, square. And just the sort of the mesoscopic uh, features, these dark lines of the skin folds, uh, these marked uh, uh, stark features are uh, hair follicles. And then when you zoom in, uh, you are looking at, uh, so if you're familiar with, uh, with the skin structure, the, the epidermis uh, connected with the dermis through these undulated structures, you have the protrusions of the dermis into the epidermis of the, uh, that are called the, the dermal papilla. So you're really looking at um, uh, pigmented cells, pigmented keratinocytes in the basal layer surrounding the, the tips of the, the dermal papilla. The, uh, the blue is, uh, is second harmonic generation from collagen, so that's one, ch one detection channel we, we have. The other one is um, uh, fluorescence, which we, uh, which we uh, time resolved. Um, we have a, uh, um, uh, really, we, we rapidly digitize the analog uh, signal from the PMT. We have a 32 time bin uh, channel. This is what we use for our analysis I'll, I'll show later, but for visualization purposes, we combine the first uh, two time beams. Uh, that's our short fluorescence lifetime. And that's, this is where we mostly detect the signal from melanin. We are lucky that uh, melanin has a uh, uh, fluorescence lifetime that's significantly shorter compared to the other uh, fluorophores in the, in the skin. Um, that, that's, it, Selective detection of, of uh, melanin is really uh, important for the applications that uh, Anand mentioned and, uh, and um, uh, others we uh, work on. It really gives us the ability to uh, quantify, uh, to, to quantify like, uh, treatments for pigmentation or, or things like that. Uh, so that's the, the short fluorescence lifetime channel. The other one is long fluorescence lifetime, which uh, we used to detect uh, uh, fluorescence from keratin uh, lasting fibers. Uh, NADH is also in that uh, in that channel. So these are the the sources of contrast and the features we we see in the uh, in the skin. Um, I wanted to show you the uh, this sort of uh, microscopic uh, scanning and how we uh, how we go back to the same location. You've seen it in clinic. This is how we acquire this. Uh, strip mosaic uh, uh, imaging. These are um, images acquired uh, at different uh, uh, different points in time. So, for instance, week one, week two, um, we acquired. Uh, we we have a large uh, set of uh, data on, on different uh, subjects, different uh, uh, skin types. Um, the main, uh, the, so the way we, we acquire this uh, longitudinal uh, type of uh, imaging and, uh, and go back, first you, uh, you identify a macroscopic mark on the skin. Uh, 
anything very small, a dot, a, a tiny, these are images acquired on, on my skin. Literally just use the, a dot, a hemangioma I have on the skin. You don't need to do any masking, anything. You just take the, the metallic ring uh, close to, uh, to that uh, the reference point you have on the, on the skin. Um, we, these images are not even acquired on the same depth. We are able to uh, locate uh, a, a reference point on the on the images uh, very uh, very easily. So after you uh, locate the, the reference point macroscopically on the skin, once you acquire the image, you would look for a um, microscopic type of uh, reference, a hair follicle, a mole would show up like a pigmented uh, uh, area. So anything you can uh, relate on uh, to. Uh, to kind of use as a reference point. And uh, uh, then you, you image either around that reference point or whatever region of interest you're uh, interested. So you, this is where you, you come and you do this tile mosaic, like a uh, few millimeters by a by few millimeters uh, squared. And that uh, you can um, uh, get with, with higher uh, resolution. So again, this is an, uh, an double uh, junction. And uh, this is where we uh, show how we can put it back the same location when we do this matching at uh, different uh, time points. And um, this is how uh, you uh, notice that we can actually track uh, cellular-like uh, structures over, over time. This is a really a big deal for this uh, uh, technology. Uh, it, uh, not not uh, not easy to to accomplish. We are uh, working on this for a, for a long time. So happy we have this uh, this feature. Um, uh, another um, uh, another thing I wanted to uh, to uh, show uh, is uh, really how. Um, so we, we do this longitudinal imaging. We go back to the same uh, to the same location. What do we do with that uh, with that information? What we really are after in the type of application that Alan uh, explained that in other applications is uh, really trying to um, identify and distinguish different optical signatures based on this label free molecular contrast. Yes. So what is changing over the weeks on the circle? Uh, nothing is changing. We just we are just able to track this particular structure, very small structure, like within ten microns. We are able to go back to it uh, over time, and that's important when you uh, monitor treatment and you want to track changes. You want to be able to uh, detect and measure those changes. There's nothing interesting in, in here, uh, this is normal skin, the, mm -hmm. so there are no changes to track. I'm just showing the ability to be able to go back to the same, okay. to the same location. That's, uh, the, <coughs> that's the feature I wanted to, to emphasize. Um, I mean, the, the other point to make is, is that, you know, there, there is natural heterogeneity in, spatially in the tissue, which really allows you to do this. It doesn't always seem. Yeah. And that's that's in every person, so that's what's kind of nice about it. Mm -hmm. if, if if the structure was uniform completely, you wouldn't be able to do it. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's uh, 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 that's one uh, um, one one uh, feature um, uh, that that this uh, this uh, uh, device can. Uh, um, I can do. I lost my uh, train of thought. Yes, I wanted to uh, to show you how. Um, so, what what do we do when we go back to the same location? We wanna uh, be able to uh, detect and distinguish different uh, um, optical uh, signatures, particularly for cells in the dermis. Uh, where uh, we have um, uh, the cells we are interested in are, are really uh, different dermal cell populations and uh, different immune cells. We want to be able to track uh, immune responses at the cellular level 
uh, in the in the scheme. And I wanted to show you a bit of a roadmap of how we plan to do that. That that's something we we currently uh, work on. And particularly on this on this image, we identify the region of interest that's really densely uh, populated with cells in the in the dermis. Something I haven't. Uh, discuss with uh, Anand yet, but probably some leak of melanin in the dermis and some macrophages showing up to to feed on it. But it's something we've been uh, imaging uh, in in my skin over time of the, the course of these uh, four weeks with not much change. But how do we plan to uh, to quantify this? How do we detect the optical signatures of these cells? Uh, our our plan is to uh, really uh, zoom in and, and track down the, the morphological signatures of so the cell size, cell shape, but also the, the fluorescence lifetime uh, signatures and the dynamic signatures as well. So these are three signatures we are, we are after. I wanted to show you the roadmap for quantifying the, the optical signatures based on the uh, fluorescence lifetime. Uh, so Alex Van Bijana in, uh, in my group is, uh, is working on, on that. So we start with this uh, image. We acquire um, uh, with, with this uh, uh, 32 time uh, uh, 32 time ins. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting down. Uh, <laughs> getting tired. Uh, this is this is split in, uh, in two. We have two spectral detection channels, 16 uh, time beams in uh, in each of them. Uh, we use uh, this uh, uh, phaser uh, analysis on each of these uh, channels, uh, where uh, we um, so each uh, based on the, the fast uh, uh, Fourier uh, transform for the the uh, decay in each uh, pixel, um, and we have each pixel is characterized by an SNG from the the uh, phasor distribution, but also uh, by two uh, spectral values. So you have these rich pixels, you have these four uh, coordinates. Uh, we build a, a, a matrix based on, on that and apply uh, a principal components uh, analysis to uh, transform to a new uh, coordinate, transform the, the data set on new coordinate uh, system where the, the main um, PCA uh, components would uh, capture the, the variance uh, in the uh, in the in the data. For the uh, the second harmonic generation channel, we have one component that capture uh, most of the, the variance. This uh, mostly uh, captures the uh, the collagen. Uh, in the uh, fluorescence channel, things get a bit more complicated. Uh, we need to segment the objects of interest. Uh, as I mentioned, we are interested in the uh, the cellular structures in the in the dermis. This is where we want to track our uh, immune cells. We do the segmentation based on the intensity to uh, to uh, sort of detect the the cellular components out of uh, to separate them out of the extracellular uh, matrix. We uh, apply the, the PCA analysis. We uh, you map the uh, two uh, main uh, components, we build a UMAP model and then uh, apply it to all the, the pixels in the, in the image. We color code that uh, uh, based on what we uh, already uh, know and then uh, the information we know is from the, from the channel visualization I mentioned earlier. We do this um, supervised clustering where we, uh, uh, again, we know some of these clusters. We know, the, for instance, the melanin clusters based on the uh, information we, we have with the keratinocytes size surrounding the, the, the macula. We know our elastin fibers. We know the, the keratin in the, the skin folds, the, the hair. Uh, there are clusters we don't know, and these are exactly the these um, uh, dermal cells, the immune cells we are uh, we are after, and uh, this is what we um, um, plan to to track down first of all um, blindly without knowing exactly what the cells are, and then um, uh, and then uh, really, uh, identifying them and. Uh, 
this is uh, this is something really uh, connected to the uh, the VT LIGO, where we try to uh, detect these T cells that are responsible for uh, uh, initiating the the disease. So, Mihaela, yes, I don't know about the rest of population, but for me, this is too much. <laughs> I don't I I, I I don't understand everything. <laughs> So, so first you have two images that are in each, say, 16 channels front, and then you have this S1, G1, and S2, G2. Can you explain what are the differences? What, what are you imaging differently? In, in this S image and this image? Yes. Yes, these are the, uh, these are the two spectral channels. Okay, so what are, the, what are those domains? What are the spectral windows? The spectral windows, we have a, a uh, blue channel that's mostly second harmonic generation. Okay. Yeah. So it's not flint, it's second harmonic generation. It's, it, it, it's they are time resolved. It's a time yeah. resolved yeah. second, second harmonic generation. Okay. Yes, this is what this 16 channel means. These are time channels. So second harmonic generation, my understanding is, isn't that spontaneous? It's, uh, it's, yes, it's spontaneous. Uh, I didn't want to, uh, I, I wanted to give a bit of the big picture. I'm yeah. sorry if I, it sounded confusing. Uh, our blue channel, it's, it's a bit uh, broad. We do have a bit of the fluorescence there. Okay. We are targeting uh, uh, the, the, we are trying to push a bit of the ADH on that okay. channel. So that's why, for instance, that's why when you look at this phasor distribution, yes. it's not exactly to zero. It's a bit, it's a bit shifted. That's because of them, some, Okay, uh, so the bottom is the blue channel, you're capturing mostly second harmonic, but a bit of yes. NADH. Okay, and then how about the other channel? The other channel is, uh, is uh, fluorescence, more like the green fluorescence, so longer uh, fluorescence in terms of... And that's the origin of that fluorescence would be, most likely? The origin of that fluorescence is what I showed uh, earlier, uh, keratin, uh, NADH, FAD. Okay. So it's a, it's a combination of a number of different potential yes. sources of contrast. Yes. Okay. So then you, you combine those into some multidimensional space. Yes. Okay. And then you try to separate out, and then you somehow have a way to map that onto two dimensions. And that's what this U1, yes. U2 map is. Yes. And then from that, you do some classification. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank yes. you. Just want to yeah. take. Yes, I want to be fast. So. Yeah, 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 but I mean, this is a course, so I want people to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really so, yeah. so go ahead, Bjorn. So, what is the advantage of doing you map after principal components? Really, to, to get this 2D uh, representation and be able to classify this. this uh, uh, populations of cells and features. We really want to see where they are with respect to each other and, and how they change. Um, so if you, you know, do really a map without the principal components, do you not get an interesting projection that tells you? If you say, say that. <laughs> if you do a you map know, directly from S1, G1, S2, G2, do you get anything interesting? If we, I'm sorry, you were talking about if you do a UMAP projection uh -huh. directly from the S1, G1, S2, G2, do you get yes. anything interesting? We'd have to talk to Alex for that. You will need to talk to Alex for that. Okay. And the other question I had was the two, the 16 channels, so it sounds like they're, are they all, sorry, do you have two separate 16 channel rooms mm -hmm. with different spectral ranges, or are they? They do have different spectral ranges. Okay. So you have like, two filters. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's because the the sources are different, right? We we try to to separate. So in the in the blue channel, we have the SHG from collagen plus some blue fluorescence. The other channel has green fluorescence. Green. When I say green, it's really broad. It's it's uh, somewhere about. Uh, 560 nanometer. This is what I. Is so it's this really all in the papers? Hmm? Is this all in the papers? Is this all published already? Uh, it's published, but this is re this is really uh, this is really new. We uh, we are still playing with the with the settings and really debating whether it's work. Um, 
keeping some blue fluorescence or pushing it all into into one channel. It's um, uh, it's really yeah. The, this stuff is uh, is not published, but uh, I'm I'm happy to talk to you more about it. Uh, cool. Also cool. with the uh, with that. So, so Mihaela, just for also for the benefit of the students, how much of this analysis you can do kind of using existing standard analysis tools or and how much of this were kind of developed in, in your laboratory? Uh, this is something we are developing now, but we I know um, Alex is, is using the... But the phaser representation is pretty standardized. Yeah. Principal yes. components is exactly. pretty standardized. So these are, these are standard. What we develop are really... Um, uh, a way to, to identify these different optical signatures based on this analysis. So we mean the clustering after you get the UMAP yeah. projection? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. With one goal being to, uh, you know, really evaluate the what, what we can distinguish, how how much of the or how many of these cell populations we can distinguish in the in the areas. And then the even more complicated part comes to uh, when we'll have to identify them. Um, so going into the UMAP stuff, um, after doing the information, are we reversing and sending it to the latent space? Are you doing the clustering right after it within the latent space or? Yeah, doing the clustering after. So after doing the information, are we dimension and sending it to the UMAP? Um, yes. Are you doing the clustering right after, or? Yes, the, the clustering is right, yes. Okay. But it's based on, uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, so some of these features we, we know, this is how we identify some of these clusters. Uh, some, we, some we don't. Okay. So it's like getting the principal components and then crossing within the? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the UMAP. What is U2 and U1? Uh, the, these are the, the main principal components. Yeah, when you do the principal component analysis, you have the two main principles. So the ones, the ones that capture the, the maximum variance in the, okay. in the data. Okay. So UMAP, very generally, is an algorithm which reprojects multi-dimensional data into two dimensions that's in a way that separates it out cleanly and you'll see groups more so. Yeah, and, and, and the other advantage about UMAP is, is that actually um, distance on a UMAP projection are actually more actually representative or, or reproducible amongst samples than if you use some of the other clustering algorithms like Tisney clustering, for example, where depending on the analysis, you'll have cells that move in different directions. And that's the other reason why and the supervised clustering and having like anchoring points of what you actually know is really important. So that when you compare samples across, you know, kind of it's different. So. Um, we can uh, talk more afterwards. I'm ready to hand it. You're handing over. <laughs> all right, so this is great because now you're all ready for the next part, which is like, so how do we kind of use all of this, right? Based on what we were talking about. So this is something that we're doing now. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> basically um, what we have is real patients with um, Bitalago. And what we're doing is we're trying to really getting a better way to measure how they uh, repigment and actually what's going on at the cellular level. So you have patients with baseline visits. We do um, biopsies and vitiligo skin and normal skin. We image the vitiligo and normal skin and look at imaging processing and we put them under therapy. And we do this repeatedly over a span of 24 weeks. And we're trying to really figure out, you know, if we can measure how individual lesions change, what are some spatial characteristics of individual lesions as they change over time. And then if we look at their gene expression analysis and then added another thing, which is the... Um, look at gene expression space, can we identify um, different populations of cells in these immune cells? So um, 
we have this ongoing study. So this is just one nice example patient. So this is a, a location on our arm that has vitiligo. Um, and you can see this depigmented patch. Um, we show an inset, and then we show over here the area in which um, we're imaging, in particular under the ring um, and on her lower form. And then we do a biopsies of these areas that we've marked and we can now track and go back to um, based on their. Uh, and again, she just went over this, but you can do a large lower resolution scan. You scan in on a higher area, and then now you can basically go back and identify based on features which area and where you are. So how do we use this information? So this is the baseline image of the vitiligo. And what you can see here, if you look up here at the top, is you can see, should I use this? You gotta use your that? Use the mouse, okay, yeah, just so it's on the zoom. Yeah. But anyways, you can see here, over here, this is the pigmented area, so you start to see, um, red um, cell cellular area, and you can see over here is an area where there's basically no melanin pigment indicated um, by no red signal, and that's shown over here as you highlight. Uh, we also took, um, you know, images of the, of the uh, biopsies and then images of the biopsies when, they, when we looked at them we, and we um, flipped them over, and we could actually see um, these immune cells, which are these, um, cells with a different fluorescence lifetime that don't really fit into the red or the green that are somewhere in the middle um, that have these um, unique characteristics that are, that are deeper in, in the dermis. So this patient started undergoing treatment, and so then we went back and imaged the same area. We had the advantage where we could use the biopsy as a way to figure out where we were before, and then we can go back and image the same area again. And you can see here now in the area that's starting to repigment, um, this is the normal area up here, or the normal skin. Um, this is the area where you're starting to see melanin come back around the hair follicles and the, uh, around the, I'm sorry, the dermal papilla. They're rather disorganized and you see some, some melanin coming back, but they're not in necessarily as discrete structures. Um, we did notice, um, you know, what's known is, is that the melanocyte stem cells migrate out of the hair and into the epidermis. And just to keep in mind, these are um, cross sections, so we're not down at the base of the hair. But what you can see is along the hair, when you start looking, you can start to see these, um, these red cells um, that are present at the base of the hair. And you can see that nicely over here, and that's highlighted over here. So these are melanin-containing cells that are migrating out of the the hair and back into the epidermis. So you can start to notice those cells as well. And then this patient, this is like the last image and you can see like pretty much she is repigmented there and mostly, right? So, um, and when we look at the, um, at the structure, what you start to notice is, is that um, in these areas where you have melanin, you have this structure where you have um, this blue area of the collagen that you can see in the middle and kind of it's like, um, so the skin goes up and down like this and what we call is the undulating dermal papilla. And when you go through a cross section, what you'll see is you'll see a section where you see the red melanin containing cells around the edge and then you see the dermal papilla coming up in the middle and you start to see these um, structures starting to, to recapitulate here like the blue and the red around it. So as the patient is repigmenting, then you're seeing more of these cells come back. And so this whole idea, and this, this wouldn't be possible if we weren't able to go back to the same spot, and if we weren't able to um, track the different cellular signatures and look at, at what's happening. Um, and this is the, uh, so it turns out one thing that was kind of interesting is, is that even when you look at visit three, you're getting repigmentation, but what's happening with these dermal cell populations, and this is what we're really trying to, to focus on, it looks like maybe they're shifting a little bit. Maybe they're not exactly the same cell populations as they were initially, but that's one of the things that we're trying to look at now. But there still are lots of cells in the dermis that are not necessarily there. In. And then the other part of this, which I didn't show, I'm just showing you one example, but we have other patients where there are no cells in the dermis. We have other patients that have completely different patterns. And so this is kind of a way that we can look at, at changes in repigmentation. Um, so this is an example of, you know, the two visits you can see over here, you're seeing the pigmentation here, it even gets a little bit darker, 
um, later on, and then you're starting to see more of the intact, intact structures of the dermal papilla. And now we're working on ways to quantify that as we're looking in three dimensions and we're looking up. So now that you can actually know the scene here, you can do these kinds of things. So now the question is, right, this is the big question that Mihaela and I um, stay up at night thinking about, all the time, <laughs> which is how do we go back and figure out what these cells are? Right? How do we figure out what these cells are, what these structures are, and what we um, So um, what we do here is this is another level. So just to, um, it relies on a lot of the same concepts that we talked about with the principal component analysis, but the principal components are slightly different. So how this works is basically you take a, um, a piece of tissue and you put it on a slide and each position on the slide has a different um, molecular barcode that tells you where that position is. And then you can measure the gene expression in each individual position. So there's a couple of ways that people do this. One way that people do this is the, um, the, uh, they put all of these dots on the slide and then basically they look at, um, they look at basically what signal is in what spatial location and you can see the signal is here and that signal is there. Now, the only problem which I'll get into this in a minute is, is that that assumes that all of the, um, the spatial uh, location is um, similar in morphology, right? Because if you have a, a square cell and you're putting it on a wrong dot, then all of a sudden it's going to go on one dot, the one next to it. So all of a sudden you're not going to see that one cell. You're going to see that, that area averaged over two spots. Um, the other way you can do it is you can take um, cells and, and preserve their border and their architecture, and then basically you determine what genes are expressed in those cells in space and then go back. And then basically you're preserving the architectural outline of the cell, and when you're identifying the genes or the spots, or the genes expressed in those spots, uh, in those cells, you kind of know what cells they're expressed in. So that's kind of, uh, you know, um, elicited here. So for this study, we used what's called as... Um, you know, uh, so, so the issue with spatial transcriptomics is depending on the way you're looking at it, and most people don't think about this problem, is that you're fitting a round, uh, a round peg into a square hole. You're basically saying all the cells are the same in your, because otherwise what you're doing is your spatial algorithm, right? So um, what we've decided is, is this is a better um, area for us because we can use several different stains. So we can stain the cells nuclei, we can say in the cell's um, interior, and we can say in the cell's boundary. So you get the shape, you get um, you know, the nucleus, and you, you can identify in how they segment. And so um, let's go back to our patient. So, so one of the things here, which I didn't, I took out, maybe I should have shown you just for, for kicks, but um, because it's not on this patient, that's why I didn't show you. But um, we found that you know, when you look at melanocytes, sites, melanocytes sites aren't round. And so that's what half of the problem is, is because since they have these projections and they're neural crest, neural derived, they have these like uh, projections that allow them to attach to other cells, you never get the projections. So if you were to average all of the data on melanocytes across an area of skin, you were to have one melanocyte, you never see it because it'd be error average over noise. But now you start putting morphology information in and you can identify where the boundary is and you can identify the cell. So now um, this is, let's go back to this patient. So this is the dermis when we look at it. And basically we can, with this technology, we can look up to 500 genes in an individual um, area. And basically we can see, um, you know, the, the T cells that are st stained with um, yellow and green over here. We can see uh, longer hunt cells which show up um, more purple and then dendritic cells. So we can see different immune populations based on their um, gene expression pattern or the amount of counts that they have. Um, you can go back, so this is another example um, zoomed in, where we're highlighting some of the cell types, like the longer hung cells, the dendritic cells, and the T cells. And if you go back and look spatially, you can kind of start to figure out in the same area where you did the biopsy, because we know when you're imaging the biopsy, you can say, well, these cells are this far from the top of the epidermis, and how does that correlate to what we saw on imaging, so you can identify um, the T cells and longer hound cells and the macrophages. Um, we're hoping to actually um, try this with, um, also this is another example where you can kind of segment all the objects in the cells and the keratinocytes and you can see the immune cells. The immune cells are kind of located around the blood vessels so they're deeper 
in the epidermis um, from the areas at the, at the top of the skin. So you can actually measure the distance. Yeah. So I've heard of spatial transcriptomics, but never thought about it. Yeah. Um, does this work by breaking up the cells and looking at their genes? Are you tagging their genes? Is it destructive? Is it? So great question. So there's a couple of different methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this method. So so there. Were, so let me go back and I'll kind of walk you through that. So there's two methods that we present here. So the Visium HD, the way that method does is you take the cell, you take the whole tissue, you put it on a um, on a uh, on a grid that has all of these different spots in it, and each of the spots are almost cellular distance apart, so they're really close to each other. And then what happens is, is when you put the tissue on the grid, basically you dissolve the cells and everything is captured in the bead on that spot. Um, and then you have PCR probes that are markers on the location. So they tell you exactly where the gene was on that spot. And then you're amplifying the genes in those spots and you say what genes are in those spots. So that's the way that that spatial transcriptomics methods happens. Now, that, like I said, that the problem with that is that if all your cells aren't the same size or whatever, problems could be a lot. So the other one, the way it works, is that you take the intact tissue and you take a probe that identifies the RNA. So you just permeabilize the cell, you identify a probe that identifies the RNA transcript it binds to each individual transcript. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And then you basically can identify where that is on tissue. Now that, you know, you're limited by color metrically to I think something like 500 probes right now, which is quite a lot for genes. So there's two ways to do it. One way is the, is the HD where you sequence everything so you can identify any gene possible whether you know it's there or you know it's not there. The second method, the problem is, is that you kind of have to input a set of genes, right, that you're looking for. So you have to kind of know what you're looking for. So you're having a color stain based on the genome of the cell, well, splitting the different genes and then finding where the spectrum is. Yeah, so you basically, yeah, you look for this, the spectra of the four four in each area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's imaging based, yeah. And the first one is sequencing based because it's basically. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so then, you know, the real challenge we're running into now is, you know, now you identify, you can say, oh, well, this is this far down from the epiderm from the epidermis, and this is kind of what we saw in the same tissue when we're looking at it by imaging. Um, the next, and so like, for example, here's a, a more in-depth thing, and you can say that you know, these cells were about 179 microns down from the epidermis. How far were they down on our um, MPM imaging? And the other, the other part, hopefully, we can get to is trying to figure out. Um, now, the other issue is, is that we're looking at different um, sectioning methods. So we're looking here, and then, you know, the MPM is, is looking at uh, vertical sections. But um, that's kind of what we're trying to get to. Well, these are just some examples of the different cells you can see. So we do see T cells. They're quite further down in the epidermis, but we see dendritic cells that are in the epidermis. Um, and you can see melanocytes as well. I don't know if I have them. Okay, so uh, hopefully what we're trying to get to is a point that Michaela was saying. Now you take the tissue, you um, do your... Uh, your principal component analysis, you separate it into different types. It's based on like size, it's based on spectral signature, it's based on location. You can go through and do the same thing with spatial transcriptomics, try to identify which cells are in which location, correlating on the same sample. And then you can um, go back and you can look at um, what is correlating with response and what's happening to these different cell types over time. And eventually there's another aspect which we didn't even talk about, which is that um, you know, which is really cool is that we can actually see cells move too. So you could look at movement parameters on the images. So um, I hope, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have questions, but I, I hope that, you know, you kind of get an idea of how we, how, how you can think about doing these things. So, so you know, you really want to think about your technology development um, as fitting a need and an application, like from the very beginning, because it really helps in terms of getting money for it. <laughs> so, so that's that's one thing. So you want to identify a technology need, and focus on the impact, 
Um, you want to think about both conceptual and technical and innovation. Uh, and I think Mihaela has done a good job of demonstrating that in her. Um, you want to identify the best technology for what you're trying to measure, a problem that's easily tractable so that you can demonstrate a need. Um, and then you identify what needs to be measured and make sure that you can measure with the right technology. Um, we, um, we are firm believers in the concept of, so, so people use this concept and it's, it's very common in translation, which is basically, um, we talk about community engagement or community engagement based research. Has anybody heard about that term? Engage this research. So the idea is basically you go through and you know you talk to patients about like what they would want out of a therapy or what they would want out of a solution, and then you try to engineer a solution that fits what the patients need. I think there's two ways to think about that. So you can think that you're. I did this startup thing, and you know we talked about the whole business plan and talk about who your customers and who your who your um, who the, the utilizers of your technology is. And in technology development, you have like the application, which is the patient, which is ultimately going to gain the benefit. And you have the people that are going to be buying and investing in your technology, which are these companies, which are the NIH, um, which are all of these other sources. So you sort of need to think about positioning things in both directions. Like how does it appeal to the NIH? How does it appeal to companies? And you know, Mihaela and I have spent, and I think we're going to spend more time this week, spent many, many hours talking to these companies and talking to these, um, to, um, to figure out what exactly are the needs that they perceive. And then we, we work on adapting the technology to kind of fit. But um, Dan, that's <laughs> So what questions do you guys have? So when you were talking about large audiences, um, what about in the opposite case when you're trying to work with like an orphan technology for like conditions that have very small populations, but you can get those? Yeah, so, so that is a really good point. So there is a, a bunch of advantages for looking at small or, or orphan diseases, um, particularly like rare diseases or rare genetic diseases. Uh, largely because, you know, we think, and it's probably true, that the pathology of them and the biology of them is a lot more constrained, a lot more easier to study, um, in a way. Um, the issue we usually have in those types of situations, really, is that um, in those types of things, you really need a technology or subject matter, I mean, a, a, a disease matter expert. Because the problem that most people have when they do those types of investigation is that they do... Um, is that they don't have enough patience or they don't have enough volume. Um, now, it may not be as big a problem as you think because the one advantage of imaging as opposed to other things that people do is that you can do it longitudinally. So you do want to think about things. And that's why with a lot of this that we talked about, I think that, you know, she realizes this and she, she highlighted this. But the real big part of this and the real big part of the advance that we have is the fact that we can go back to the same spot. That's bigger than you can imagine. Because once you start being able to longitudinally, just start thinking about it, if you can longitudinally measure change over time and you can longitudinally measure the same patient over time, you get more data, right? As opposed to looking at population samples. And then when you look at rare things or things where you don't have that much data, you immediately start expanding what you're actually looking at, right? So, so I think that you know, when you start thinking about those types of studies where you're looking at orphan diseases or rare diseases, do you have access to patients and can you get lots of data on those patients, whether it be like you know, over time or whether it be from a lot of patients? So those are those are the challenges with those, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking um are they made up from like sorry if I missed this part? From the patient skin, like you take a sample from the skin or you're used to the within the patient? Uh, take the sample from the patient's skin. Yeah, yeah. Are you taking it from like a sample from the patient skin, or are you just keeping it? No, it's the same. It's patient skin. When we're doing imaging, we do biopsies too, so we're taking sa samples from the patient. So you still do PCR within the patient's skin? We do, but it's on the tissue we take off. So we okay. take the tissue, okay. we image it, and then we um, we do the the um, the gene expression now. Yeah. So you still have to do like all the housekeeping genes and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
we have a couple of projects that we're looking at like this. Like, you know, we have this one, we have another one which we're doing the opposite where, you know, we're looking at patients with melanoma that are on immunotherapy and we're looking at immune cells coming in so that we can look at one spot and for those patients, how would you tag specific genes within you know, their skin? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think some of the things are, yeah, so, so that's the other part that's a really good thing to think about, is that for certain things, you have to think about the practical limitations, yeah. right? So like, for example, with a patient with melanoma, for example, when you're putting them on a standard of care th therapy, you can't be going through, because they have cancer, you can't go through and like take tissue all the time and look at it, right? So, because that, you know, interferes with the outcome, the end outcome. So you have to kind of think about those things. Okay. Yeah, so I work with phlegm and I'm used to being in a lab with a giant setup, you know, and so I'm just wondering what were some of the challenges translating that to a, a clinical use and maybe some of the drawbacks or limitations uh, going from lab to Clinic with such a. Maybe just a few takeaways. I don't know. <laughs> um, the high mind was the question more focused on like the technology challenges or the logistics? Um, probably more logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Logistics. Uh, those are the the most complicated, especially with these uh, complex technologies. Um, the main, um, so, so there are, there are different aspects of the, of the logistics. One is, uh, you know, the physical aspects. You need to have the instrument in, in clinic. Uh, so you need to, so, so that was something we, we've been working on, on that for, uh, for years. And I have stories of where we started. Uh, to where we are now. Um, so you need to, to get your uh, foot in the door somehow, uh, you know, like really find a solution. And you, you need to find the right people to, to work with, to do that. And then once you have the instrument there, you, you need to have uh, someone, a researcher that's available. <coughs> Who enjoys both the technology, but then also stepping into clinic and working with clinicians and with with patients. Mm -hmm. um, then, then you you need to to engage the, the clinicians. You need to to identify the ones who can make the the time. I was lucky to to work with someone like uh, Anand, um, and. And keep them uh, engaged, you know, engaged. Don't, you know, get your data and uh, go back and your own data. It needs to be a continuous communication and in the back and forth. Right. Do you feel like there were any limitations you had going to the clinical use, like with resolution or time or any, anything that you had to sort of sacrifice in order to get it to the form it is now? We tried not to sacrifice resolution. That was one thing I, I didn't, like, we tried not to compromise on. But uh, it's, we did use, so as I said, we've been working for, for many years and uh, this is a continuous, uh, you know, back and forth. You develop your instrument, you go to clinic, you use it, you identify the limitations, you bring it back in the uh, in the lab and optimize whatever is, is needed. So this device is really based on all the feedback we've got uh, from, uh, from uh, our pilot clinical studies. We initially started with a with a commercial device. I think Anand had it on one of his first slides, the, the anti-flex. That's the, the one that really captures 200 by 200 micron uh, images. So we really uh, struggled with, with that. So I knew that if I wanted if we wanted to continue to do that, we, we needed a, a larger field of view. Yeah. 
So the, the other the other aspect of it, just to um, that I know we struggle with a lot, Mihila, did, um, is the time aspect. Okay. Because one thing you can do with um, with Flynn when you're in the lab and you have a big Flynn device is you have a lot of time to image and capture a, a lot of signals. But when you're imaging at a bed at a, be a bedside, right? Like you have very limited time window. So you know, I don't think she put it in here, but how you basically yeah. distinguish signals given the limit, more limited time window that you're measuring is one, one consideration. And I think a lot of people in the, I don't know if you still get this, but a lot of people in the very beginning had a lot of trepidation with the whole idea of, of not measuring a whole flim, flim signal, right? Didn't we, we had a lot of um, experts in flim that were not yeah, so this is, this is yeah. where we, we compromise, for instance, on the time resolution for uh, yeah. yeah, that's sort of what I was, one of the main things I was wondering about, because yeah. when I'm taking flim data, I'm just sitting there forever playing. Exactly. Yeah, so you kind of got to figure out, and that's why all of this stuff that we talked about, about, you know, distinguishing the signals and how you distinguish different signals for different cells, you know, we have to be creative about how we, we do that because it's not going to be the same. Right? And so that is one, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think that's one big yeah. challenge we've run into. Yeah, yeah it, really, it really depends on the application in the, in the lab. You can afford that and you can, uh, you can get your information more. Absolutely. Here we are not interested in absolute values of lifetime. Or I, I just want to be able to capture differences in cell population based on differences in lifetime and not necessarily being accurate in, in getting the particular, yeah. for instance, lifetime value. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. So you guys are all tired now. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about your thoughts about the cross correlations between the spatial transcriptomics and the classifications that we're seeing, you know, is there a, a time course associated with that too? Is, you know, do you, do you see that, that, that maybe there's kind of a, a direction of time, meaning that, the, that there are genetic changes precede that is a biophysical? I, I, I imagine that the sources of contrast that Mahila is identifying are things associated with cellular and extracellular matrix ultrastructure, uh, changes in cell population or cell metabolism, cell dynamics, which presumably would be downstream from certain upstream changes gene expression. in gene expression. Yeah. So, so the one thing I would say, which I didn't put in here, um, is that the one thing that does seem to correlate a lot more is the melanin signature. So when you see melanin genes coming on, mm -hmm. the, and the correlation with seeing um, melanocytes in the epidermis, they seem to be much more correlated. So that seems to be almost a lot more one-to-one. -one. You see the melanin genes come on, and then you see the, the pigment. So that seems to be quite rapid. And what's, what's rapid? Huh? What's rapid? Meaning, like, typically you think that um, you see a gene expression change, or you see genes upregulated, and typically it takes, like, 24 hours to see proteins upregulated to see the, the pigment being produced. But here we see, we see those correlations seem to be, and it might be because some of it's going on with pre-existing genes that were transcribed, and you get activation of new genes, and you're seeing those new genes, um, and that's not yet making pigment, but it's telling you what cells are, basically, right? So, um, so that seems to be more of a one-to-one -one thing. The, um, the T a lot of these genes that we're looking at are like more intrinsic labels that are going to label a cell, mm -hmm. and not necessarily that they're... Um, so one way you can think about it in terms of kinetics is, is like, um, you know, cell, cell ID and cell movement or cell number versus cell... Um, activation of gene expression. So a lot of the, mo uh, the molecules we're looking at that we've, uh, are just basically markers of specific cell types, not necessarily. So it's not like the genes are going on when right, you're seeing right. the T cell. The, the genes are telling you that they're T cells, basically, yeah. But the, the melanin will be interesting because that's the one where I think that's probably gonna be more of the case. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's hard to know with you know, you're just seeing the genes that are on and the cells that are yes. already making it, right? So, 
I would imagine like in animal models, you could actually do a more detailed kinetic analysis and cross correlation between imaging and whatever features Mahila's classification algorithms are honing on and the yeah. transcript. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. But that's an expensive study. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. The only problem is why I would stick away from animal models a little bit is, is that the, the epidermal dynamics is so different. So in, in, in mice, um, you know, they don't have an epidermis. Typically, they have one cell layer epidermis, and they don't have melanocytes in the epidermis. So when you're imaging um, longitudinally in mice, you can't really, you know, everything's in the hair. You can't really see it. And so then that gets to be a problem um, about correlating back and forth. You could do pigs, but pigs are very expensive. And yeah, I, I'd rather stay away from pigs. <laughs> so. Yeah. I guess a, a question a bit unrelated, but I was just curious if you know about like light therapy. Mm -hmm. It's like pretty famous now. I feel like in social media, like the red light for like, reading oh, yeah. your skin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so the so that's a good question. I think there's a lot of um, so so the red light therapy. Uh, it's really hard, and that's a really you know if anyone's going to be able to figure it out, it's probably her. But. Um, there's very, very few biomarkers that actually changes. So that's the problem with red light therapy. It's supposed to enhance collagen, it's supposed to, but like it's really hard to quantify collagen signatures. Um, and this is kind of one of the few ways that you can actually try to do that. Um, the changes are so subtle, it's really hard to pick up anything. And then the light therapy we're talking about here is near then UVB therapy, which um, you know does induce DNA damage and then it induces repair and then it induces repigmentation. That's kind of how this works. But that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah. Thank you. If you. There's a lot of companies that want to be able to figure out to measure them, <laughs> but nobody's been in. In fact, didn't we try to apply for something on that one time? No. <laughs> somebody, somebody asked me to like find out a way to do this, and I, I wrote this big thing, and then I never heard from you. <laughs> the, the, the other part that's a little tricky is that um, just to keep in mind, there is what's and, and you'll notice the thing. Uh, there, there's a couple of couple of different key terms to keep in mind. Um, a clinical study does not mean an FDA approved study. So most of the light therapies haven't gone through FDA. And then just to think of the difference between FDA clear device versus you know FDA approved therapy. Is there a huge difference, like in terms of the regulatory um, involved? So clear devices just has to show safety and no efficacy and achieving um, a measurable endpoint. So, and in fact, a lot of the companies stay away from actually showing that because then if they have a negative result, then they can't market the device, right? Mm -hmm. So then they don't even want to study it. So just... mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, that let's thank our two speakers. Thank you. One more question. One more question. Why is it that I'm using? I 